report and things like that. So, and it looks at one hour of data. So when you start, of course, you don't have one hour of data. So the ventilator will use the FAO tools that you set as a starting point, actually, to, to assess how sick your lung is. So it means that if you start at 21%, but actually the requirement of your patient, the base is around 30 out of, outside of the episode of hypoxemia or hyperoxia, ventilator will be running after your patient. It won't work properly. So it's very important when you start to maybe take a little bit of time to observe your patient, to have an idea of how, what the base is before starting the ventilator, because ventilator won't react at the maximum that he should. So you're sick, huh? So you just, once you have done that, you just do a long press, and then you have oxygen available, and you just... And it shows the target range you set. Yeah. So hopefully you should turn the oxygen down now, right? Because I'm saturating it up a little bit. So we, we already started at 32, yeah. So it depends on, on your oxygen. Yeah. He's doing a lot of fluctuation. Maybe you want to make it longer. If you're not comfortable with that, uh, I just give this one. So here is to remove the delay of the audible alarms. So it means that here, for example, you set a low target at 90. Your, your low alarm of the SPO2 is at 90. If it drops five below at 85, immediately you will have the alarms. It doesn't give you any delay. So like that, you, are no, you know what is happening in your patient and you avoid some alarms. Okay. I want to change. No, I was going to say, if it starts high, I'll hopefully be yeah. saturating high, right? And it will be down. very slow. Okay, all right. Because your reference auto yeah. is very slow. <laughs> Don't go all the way down. Though. No, I mean... Because I'll, I'll be hypoxic. Yeah. Mm. You, you I be. set the target range to 90 to 94. So before starting oxygen, one of the very important point I mentioned to you that the ventilator will take into account uh, uh, how sick your lung is with a shunt and things like that. So, and it looks at one hour of data. So when you start, of course, you don't have one hour of data. So the ventilator will use the FAO tools that you set as a starting point, actually, to, to assess how sick your lung is. So it means that if you start at 21%, but actually the requirement of your patient, the base is around 30 out of, outside of the episode of hypoxemia or hyperoxia, ventilator will be running after your patient. It won't work properly. So it's very important when you start to maybe take a little bit of time to observe your patient, to have an idea of how, what the base is before starting the ventilator, because ventilator won't react at the maximum that he should. Sure, go on. So you're sick, huh? So you just, once you have done that, you just do a long press, and then you have oxygen available and you just... And it shows the target range you set. Yeah. So hopefully you should turn the oxygen down now, right? Because I'm saturating it up a little bit. So we, we already started at 32, yeah. So it depends on, on your oxygen. Yeah. Is where, yeah, is where... Mm -hmm. Is, is keeping going up and down is where you might want to take over to. No. Okay. If the signal quality goes down, Oxygenie, 
The reference O2 is a value that the ventilator has calculated, uh, is a requirement of the FO2 to keep your patient within the target outside of the episode of hyper or hypoxemia. So it's telling you the base. The ventilator, we don't, we don't have it in the trains, but I will ask the team actually to note this one because this one is telling you actually if the requirement is increasing or not. Because when you have the nurses, they might go for hypoxemia, they, they go up, and then they, they see if they go down to the same points than we started. And if after a few adjustments they see that they keep going up, actually they might call you and say, oh, yeah, I might have a problem. But here you won't see it. But what you will see is the reference O2, which is recalculated every 30 minutes, will go up. And it tips you that something changed. And on the graph you s is, is this line, the dotted line here. So this one will be, the first time is one hour, and then every 30 minutes it will be realistic. So you could do an open lung with this and increase your mean airway pressure and if your yeah. FO2 is decreasing and you say it's a pressure so you have to be by so you have to understand that's what you're measuring yeah. so that just runs yeah so on the streets can be seen as can be seen as a can be done in, in all the invasive mm -hmm. or all the non invasive We've definitely used it a lot in non invasive I think that's what maybe the weaning might be. You know, your high flow yeah. needs are working enough. Yeah, I think weaning is probably yeah. where it's got a benefit as well. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the association term is different. So you don't need to have to be writing. Yeah. Can you please have that? Do you want to keep doing more things? Or are you so tired you have to go? I'm watching the idea. You hide the one on the scope. <laughs> it's the same technology, it's a massive. So, if you were to be like a consultant, you would be trained to be able to be like trainees, consultants. You'll be able to be the senior. You're the most senior. I was just saying, there's a high rate of junior to senior European in the line. <laughs> so, do you want to? No, I've turned the sound so I should have. So 20 on 6? No, you just intubate. What are you going to do? So the baby is 1 kilo. Is 
So what are you wanting to do there? You're wanting to trigger... So you, can, so you want to synchronise every breath that the patient has. Is that different from SIV? Why? So here, we're, yeah, you're exactly right. It'll trigger how many breaths? So it's okay. This is the same. Okay. Yeah. So I've kept the uh, breathe, I see 40. So, so he's breathing at 16. So I'm sorry, how fast is this baby breathing? Wait because it's over. Yeah. But you can see on the wave there. Yeah, it's it's so, so some of these breaths are unsupported, aren't they? Mm -hmm. How do you know what a breath is, a breath is on, a triggered breath is on things like this? Yeah. 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 yeah, and what else? Yeah, they change color. Right? They make it easy for us, right? <laughs> So you can see here we've got a lot of triggered breaths and not many pressure change, right? So, so you're exactly right. We're only supporting 40 breaths. We're offering many more than that. And PTV allows us to do what? It's all the breaths, yeah. So hopefully we'll see that now. So you can see now that we're triggering the breaths. And as you say, the So is this, a, this is good, sir. We're happy with all of this? Oh uh, yeah, they both win. I was going to say, right, I'm just going to stop so I don't have to keep doing this. Um, no, no, no. So, how do we know? How, how do you define what a breath is on a ventilator? How does a ventilator know the baby's breathing? Yeah. So what? So how does it triggers off this, right? Yeah. So how do you? What's the flow trigger here, sir? Point six. So if you have a look at this flow wave, this baby has to generate all of this gas flow before it triggers. So do you think that's the best trigger? For this one. The peak flow is 2 litres and the trigger is 0.6, so that means this baby, 30% of the baby's inspiratory effort it has to do without any support. And then the rest of the peak for the initial inspiratory effort gets support. So here we may say, right, we actually want to turn the trigger down. So it goes down to 0.2, so you can see here it's much lower. Now the risk here is you can auto trigger a lot more, so you have chaos in the system. Um, but I only have to take a little breath here and If I set this up very high, we'll just go to point eight one. There's less you know, I don't have to actually Yeah, I can take a little breath. So always make sure you just check that the trigger is low enough for support ventilation. Um, are we happy with the rest of this ventilation settings? Are they perfect? What do you think? Yeah. Passing back to the... What's wrong? You could also say, oh, I think it's fine to consult the two Oh, we've got the item too short. Yeah, well done. So is that why you changed that? What was, does everyone understand that? Yeah. It's okay to say no, because most people don't. Yeah. 
Can you see here? But here, the flow is going into the lungs. Okay, and then and then inspiration is this bit here. Expiration is this bit here. You can see that expiration is actually starting right up here before the lung has got back to zero flow. So when we take a breath in, we have gas moving into our lungs. At the end of a full breath in, there's no gas moving up, so our flow should be zero. And then the direction of flow changes the other way, and it should get back to zero again before the next inflation. So here, exactly right. I've never seen anyone do this first time. So Excellent, so you don't need to be here at all. Um, um, the eye time here is too short, right? So we're on targeted tidal volume, and in this mode, we're denying the baby some tidal volume. So it may not be a big change here, but you had a 0.35, didn't you? And what did you want it to show? Where is that? You won't be able because you have a regulation where the PIP can go below three. Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, I'll fix that in a minute. Um, where, how do you want this wave to look? Is that? Did you say 0.35, or did you have it higher than that? Yeah. Still not doing it. <laughs> That's still too short, right? So this lung is not like a newborn baby lung, yeah. is it? It's a bit different. This is the lung we've got. It's not the lung we think we've got. It's the real lung. That's getting closer, right? Obviously, and if we look at our tidal, uh, our pressures are so low. Right? If we go much higher than this, we'll go really high. We won't get inspiratory hold yet, but we risk it. You can see that we've got a period of zero flow. Yeah. So you generally don't need to have much zero flow. If you're apneic, just a little bit of zero flow is good, so you get gas distribution. But here, probably it's about 0.6 that you want, right? That's probably perfect, yeah? And what about our expiratory time? Is that adequate? Do we have zero flow? Yeah. So if you've got a blood gas here, which was, the CO2 was really high, what would you do to bring the CO2 down? You're hiding in the back, I'm going to ask you questions. <laughs> no, no, it's alright, I'm just joking. What would you do here? Yeah, which one are you going to do? So here we have 0.6. Yeah. The TI is perfect. So each, 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 yeah. You, you, if you increase your TI, no additional tidal. Yeah, there won't be any additional tidal volume going in here. You could increase your TI a little bit. You might get a little bit, but, but eventually you'll get no further tidal inflation. So you've only two things to change. If your eye time is correct, you can change. There's three things you can change. You you can change your P. You can change your rate, or you can change your tidal volume. Let's assume we've got the right peak. Obviously, if this peak was three, then I would be. But let's assume it's the right peak. So you're going to change rate or tidal volume. Which one would you change here to bring the CO2 down? Or to a pole, which one would you change? It is a patient trigger ventilation, so we'll try to change the target one. Okay, Let, but at the moment our patient's apneic. So <laughs> let's assume we've muscle relaxed this patient. I'm just trying to go for a forward exercise. Yeah. Then, yeah. then we'll do the rate. Increase the rate. You would increase the rate? Would you increase the rate or change tidal volume? Increase the Sorry? Kieran? Inspiratory time. Depend on the lung disease, but I think uh, right. rate is achieving. 
The lung disease, this so is actually the lung disease is killing him. Yeah. So he's not using a lot of high pressure. It would increase the rate because it would be less body trauma. Yep. Exactly. If you're in the early yeah. stages and you know if there is scope, suppose suppose slightly like bigger baby, then you may consider. Right or tighter volume on this patient right now. This patient. Not every patient. This patient. He's got PIB. Because we're not treating any other patient. He's got a very good. Rate of the oxygenation. Is CO2 is, is very high. Yeah, and if the oxygen is not too high, you don't want to change the oxygen. So would you do right or tighter volume? Yeah. Why is that? Assuming that the oxygenation is okay. Yeah. Why would you do right? Because you're only focusing on the CO2 yeah. at the moment, not the oxygen. But why would there's still time in the E time is exactly, still yeah. giving both some scope. work exactly the same. And I agree, you're I think I agree with what all of you are saying, right? Because we're worried about giving more pressure and volume, right? We hate that because we're neonatologists, right? And as you have clearly said here, you've got this whole bit of zero flow. So the lung is finished expiring and it's waiting before the next breath. So we can safely put more inflations in here without causing over um, auto peak. Oh. So we go in here and now you're seeing we're getting back to zero flow and we've got more breaths in a minute. Our minute ventilation will have gone up and we haven't changed our tidal volume. But right now, if we went up again, We're, this is about as far as we can go, right? Yeah, but I'm just getting a little the, bit of auto peak. If we keep the, going up, I just want to keep doing this just to show it. Now, we're getting back to zero flow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Our pip's going up, right? Yeah. Because we've got, see how the flow is not getting back to zero? This yeah. is auto peak that you're reading mm -hmm. the textbooks, right? So, when we had the first wave, we had all that time at zero flow. So we can increase rate without having to increase tidal volume and get CO2 clearance. But here, if we increase rate, we're gonna cause auto peak. So if we had the same blood gas now with a high CO2, we have to increase tidal volume, don't we? Because increasing rate will be bad for the pollution. So you can use the waves to help you understand what the right thing is, right? So why is our why do you think our eye time is so long? Because this is not what we see on normal babies. Babies don't need these long eye times, do they? This is a pretty normal eye time in Piku, though. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. This is designed as a old, old patient lung probably. This lung this, doesn't yeah. have any disease. Yeah. Right? So, so a healthy lung, lung yeah. is the time constant of the lung is the time you need to be able to get gas in and get gas out of the lung. Well, actually, the I time is five time constants. So, um, and it's telling us about resistance and compliance. So at the moment, we have a lung that has fairly normal resistance and compliance, right? If we increase the resistance a little bit, that one's better, the middle one. That's a lot of resistance, right? Mm. Now we've got a very asthmatic-y sort of beat bronchitis on. But you can see our wave has dampened mm. because it, yeah, it takes a long time for gas to move. So our peak flow will be less. We've got the same volume in, but it needs more time for that volume to move. And you can see now our eye time is way too, uh, too short and we're getting auto peak. So we have to use a much lower rate. We'll have to go do what they do in Piku and put babies on low rates. Um, and we'll now need a much longer eye time too. And now we're starting to see a better picture. And we can probably have a rate of about 40 to 45 there. That's the right one. So now we have a problem. That's too much resistance, right? Now we fix the resistance, we've unblocked our tube, and you now you can see that our numbers are all wrong and we have to change them again. But we don't, what about this? What have I done here? 
Sorry? Yeah, I've made this is a stiff love. <laughs> so, yeah. And what what's happened to our time constants? Folders improve, increase like crazy. Reduce time constant. Time constant decreases, doesn't it? Resistance is normal. You can see that here. And the compliance is down. So decrease compliance. It's compliance times resistance times five is your eye time. So it's now gone down. So that's why preterm babies need much lower eye times than term babies with normal mums. The baby who comes back for their um, malrotation repair is going to need a very different set of ventilator settings compared to the baby who's a preterm baby that you have. So now, do you want to, who, you've done all of this. Does someone else want to set the eye time here? So consultants never do it, do they? Yeah. Why don't you f find it for me? Which one's the right? You tell us which is the right. You're doing all the hard work. I'll make it even more non-compliant. There you go, that way. That's too long now, isn't it? That looks pretty good. Well done. And you can see that we have a lot more breasts now, right? And for a preterm baby, they often spontaneously breathe at 60 to 80, don't they? Um, and we can see why they can do it. And you can also see why we would use, in a preterm baby, a fast rate, low tidal volume is mechanically appropriate for the baby's lungs. But a baby with bronchiolitis, a fast rate may actually be 20 or 30 breaths a minute, not 60. Um, so using the fastest rate you can for the baby's lungs with the lowest tidal volume you can. So why did you pick four of these people who didn't? Why did you pick four to six mil per kilo for volume guarantee? Oh, and you should now see that our PIP has gone up, right? PIP is 10. If I took it out, I think it was very small, wasn't it? Why is our PIP not coming down? I've taken the compliance, compliance problem away. And our PIP is the same, 9.8. 9.9. Why is that? Our uh, time is too short, right? should drop the pip when we increase the eye time. time too short and volume guarantee generally the pip will go up by a centimetre or two of water so you should start putting the pip up. It's done it a little bit. But I'll go back to this one. Um, what is the why did you pick four to six mil per kilo?
Ventilating here, right? That's where gas exchange occurs. But the ventilator is delivering tidal volume based on a measurement here. So we have to take into account the dead space. So we need to make sure we've got enough alveolar ventilation, which is generally about two to two and a half mil per kilo. And the dead space is generally about one and a half to two mil per kilo in a normal newly born baby. So four mil per kilo, three and a half to four mil per kilo is generally the lowest tidal volume. So obviously we want to use the lowest possible tidal volume. We, so somewhere around the four to six range will be appropriately right for most babies shortly after, after birth. But if the dead space changes, then you'll need a higher or lower tidal volume, right? So when does our dead space change? Yep, so yeah, but that's actually quite a small component. So everyone gets really worried. I don't know, did, did, when I was a trainee, everyone was just cutting the tube. As soon as you intubate it, you get the chest x ray and then you trim the tube straight away, and then inevitably you couldn't get the ET connector in, and someone's trying to delay it, and the baby's going, You <laughs> four centimeters beyond the mouth. Yes, yeah. and, that's and that's I don't know, is it like that in India now? We used to do that in America. And now, what are people doing? No one cares. Yes, like you go on the order and all the tubes are just the normal tubes in. And I think, is that in Britain? Do they still cut the tubes? It's harder to change their practices, eh? Hey? They've done it for 300 years. They're not changing now. <laughs> um, it may make a difference, but most of the dead space is below, isn't it? It's the dead space here. Yeah, so... I don't know. And then you get these babies with tubes. It probably makes a difference to the resistance. It reduces the airway resistance yeah. to an extent. It probably matters but more it doesn't a two and a half tube than a three and a three and a half tube. But most of your dead space is actually in the lung itself. Anyways. So when does your lung dead space, your, alve your airway dead space change? Shunt. 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 Sorry? Intrapulmonary shunts. Yeah, that changes your relative dead space, yeah. Yeah, so in chronic BPD, when you're born preterm, over time your airways dilate. So if you're 33 or 34, if you're 33 or 34 weeks after preterm birth, you have bigger airways and they become a bit more malacial as well, so they collapse, which is what we know here. So you'll need, if you ventilate, as I was saying yesterday, if you ventilate a 28 weeker maybe on day one, you're going to use four to six mil per kilo. But if that baby's being ventilated at 35 weeks corrected for its stoma closure, you will often need a higher tidal volume. And I'd probably start that baby at five to seven rather than four to six. Some people would start that baby at eight. Um, and if you have a baby with really nasty cystic BPD, um, at term corrected, they often will need eight or higher mil per kilo tidal volumes. So, just be aware that in preterm babies your dead states changes. So the four to six is, and remember that's the lowest range. And if you're not clearing CO2, you need a higher tidal volume. But as a general rule, if your tidal volume is going up and up and up, then what should you ask yourself? So say, say, say you're on the conventional ventilation of volume targeting, you keep doing blood gases, you're over -vent under ventilated, so you keep increasing your tidal volume and your tidal volume, you've got four, five, six, sorry? Yeah, yeah, so, for, but you keep coming back and saying every time the CO, we're, we're having to increase our, tide, our volume guarantee more and more and more. Leaks. Yeah, it could be leak, what else? I'll come back to leak. Could be flow for obstruction. Yeah. Anything else? The lungs are. Could be not recruited. Yeah. So just remember, if you have 
poor CO2 clearance, it may be an under-recruited lung because atypic or an over-distended lung, mm -hmm. um, both of them cause an impairment of compliance, which means you need a higher tidal volume. So um, there's a very uh, famous old, uh, which was quite old now, um, Canadian anaesthetist who was one of the founders of high frequency, Alison Fruits. I don't know if you remember, she was doing a lot of studies in, uh, she did all the animal studies on high frequency in the eight, late 80s and early 90s. And she used to always say with high frequency, if CO2 is your problem, go to your mean airway pressure, which is different from what we teach, right? She always say, and I think that's really important. So don't forget um, that in most cases you don't need to do that. It's just that you need to change your tidal volume. But if it's a persistent problem, ask yourself, have I got the wrong peak? And it may mean you need to change it. That's a sort of a, a more advanced trick. But 90% of the time you're going to change your rate, you're going to change, and if they're breathing, you don't change your rate, you're going to change your tidal volume, aren't you? And you can look at your minute ventilation. So what's the normal minute ventilation of a neonate for CO2, appropriate CO2? You are mouthing an answer. Why, why is that? What's your reasoning for that? The, the rate that it's yeah. so it's rate times tidal volume, but it's about right, yeah? So this is not alveolar minute ventilation, it's minute ventilation measured on the ventilator, because alveolar minute ventilation will be a bit lower, won't it, yeah. But if you think about it, around about, I say 240, 200 to 240, but 300. Um, most, think about a preterm baby, they're on a rate of 60, four mil per kilo. That's about 240, right? Yeah. So you can look here, and you can see here it's 400. So we expect that um, if we divide that by one kilo baby, that's actually a pretty good minute ventilation. I think our CO2 would be good. And we'd probably expect that anyway because of how good the, the ventilation was, how easy it was. Um, and it's a good way to look at your blood gases too, to look at that number. So if your minute vent, if you get a blood gas and you've got a CO2 that's really high, and your minute ventilation is like 120 mil per kilo per minute, then you know what's wrong, right? Where's the problem? The problem is me. I've got the wrong numbers here. Yeah? I'm under ventilating that patient. And almost certainly I've got the wrong tidal volume or the wrong rate, and I'm the problem there, or the wrong peak. If my minute ventilation is actually pretty good, and my CO2 is going up and my oxidation is getting worse, that's worsening disease, and you'll probably be targeting a higher thing. So, yeah. So, I do look at this. I don't know. Do you look at the minute ventilation a lot? I think people ignore it on the ventilators <laughs> because they look at these. But I think it's a really useful one to look at to help understand your blood gases as well. Yeah. So, what else could we show? Do you want to know? Because you know all the answers. I want to know a little bit about the rise time. Ah. Is it, <coughs> oh, Alright, that anyway. I'm going to ask you all, do you think we should alter the rise time? We usually never touch that panel no at all. No one touches the rise time. What do you think? Sometimes, especially in the chronic BPD, especially when they are non-invasively ventilated yeah. to improve oxygenation. Why? Again, I think map. it's a resistance so, just to help. Helps to improve the map. Improve the map. What, yeah, what does the rise time do? So here the rise time is very quick, right? So it's the amount of time that the, I'm going to put the radar just so that we can see more breaths. So and I'll just get a few in. It's the amount of time it takes to go from peak to peak inflation pressure. So the quicker the rise time, the more square the wave. The slower the rise time, the uh, smoother or more curved the wave. And we'll just drop that right No, no, I want to show it first. We'll start at one end. So now we have a really very quick rise time. Very quick rise. Yep. And then we've just got this bit of pressure equilibrization. If we're on an adult ventilator, be, that's where they talk about the... The, not the overshoot, where they talk, that's where the driving pressure is, because it's where your plateau pressure is, I'm looking at all of that, but it doesn't matter on our ventilators. So now we've got a very quick rise, 
look what happened to our flow. To generate a quick change in pressure, you have to push gas push really gas quickly. Right now. And now we'll go. So this is not quite that far. This is two thirds of. So our I times 0.3, and now our rise time is two thirds of the um, I inspired time. And you can see that the very difference in the, the waveform and what's happened to our pressure, our flow wave. It's blunted, hasn't it? So, why is this a good thing? Well, Rio trauma. Yeah. So, Rio trauma, we don't have any clinical trials of this, but potentially Rio trauma in very uh, sick, non-compliant lungs. When you've got resistive lungs, it's not so important, right? Because you've already got something slowing gas flow down. Um, it potentially helps with distribution of gas within the lungs, which I think is what you were alluding to. Is that more right? heterogeneous. You get more heterogeneous gas flow. Now, we think we're, we, we're just writing up an animal study now looking at different rise times effectively. And, and the, the small finding that Maybe it does look like there's more distal gas distribution with a slower flow, but we're more interested in injury. But I think, yeah, theoretically, you get a longer, distribu better distribution of gas. Um, so you expose the lung to less peak flow. So if you are really worried about the rio trauma or the risk of shearing injury, it's potentially more advantageous. No clinical trials. Okay, just remember that. And But, you know, Jane in particular, when I talk to her, she says... If I have a 23, 24, 22 weaker, especially who's had poor antenatal care, I would never expose them to more than two to four litres a minute of ventilation, peak flow. Um, so she runs their flows really low. I probably run them at half that, you know, up again. Right? I wouldn't want to run them at a fast rise time. It's very immature babies, I tend to run like this. Where's the risk there? There's something now that I've done that's changed. Sorry? What did you ask? I've, I've turned you? my flow down, slowed the speed the lung's inflating. But that means that now the time I, I need 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 needs really to be long. longer. So do remember when you're using, if you are going to use a slower rise time, you will be needing a longer I eye time. Yeah. And you can see we've changed oh, that. Yeah. Uh, changing, uh, you expressions you beginning before. Exactly. And this is the other problem. If you go really, really slow in your flow and have a slow rise time, the baby has to work harder mm -hmm. to get the breath in. Yeah. So there's going to be a sweet balance point between that. Um, so if you are going to go very slow, and we do that here, now you can see that our rise time has gone right down. And we've got a very smooth, a flat curved wave, the baby's going to have to work harder during inflation. So if you're seeing an increased work of breathing, then you need to uh, uh, go back again. Um, this is something I've done occasionally as well, if I'm in PSV, which as you said, is a mode where on PTV we're triggering inflation, on SIV we trigger inflation, but we don't trigger expiration. So our eye time is always fixed, even if the baby wants a shorter eye time. And most babies, this is actually quite a nice way, you lose, see how we lose that little curve you get here? When you're on synchronised ventilation, you've got to set your eye time just so you get that nice straight line coming down, or it should be angled. You don't get that curve out because the baby's sucking his moving chest wall. So you, you set your eye time separately. I didn't get that. Can you explain oh. it again? Here, the patient, the patient has um, actively pulled the chest wall down. Mm -hmm. So, and then they recoil, and you've got a lot more. The recoil is different, so you don't get the classic zero flow mm -hmm. uh, because you transition from inspiration to expiration much quicker mm -hmm. because if you're snapping. You've got two different components to your um, pump. Um, so I tend to set, if you get something like this, that's perfect. But if not, I'm just wanting to see a line that is not quite straight, it changes sign. And then your eye time's probably okay. If your eye time's too short, it goes straight down. Um, 
and you can see that just is subtly changing here. Um, but in pressure support, what you're now doing is you're also asking it to trigger expiration, aren't you? So here, if I breathe really fast, it will start to decrease the eye time, which you can see on the ventilator here, the eye time's changing. And then when I go to apnea, you can see it's going back to the fixed point four, so the maximum eye time. And you set a maximum one to stop the baby going and holding their breath forever, right? But the problem on pressure support, I don't know, have you all, you all used pressure support? Yeah. And what do you think? Not used very frequently. No, most people. Not as a separate, not as a standard. Yeah. Do you use Combine it? Combine it. Combine it. Yeah, that's probably what I do as well. But um, the problem is you can allow hyperventilation. Yeah. So now you can see I'm ventilating at an eye time of 0.18 because the baby is just going <laughs> and you've taken the break away from the eye time, right? So how do you, there is, generally, most people just turn the baby off pressure support. Um, if you want to keep them on, you can use your rise time as a break. So if they're breathing and panting, put your rise time up really high so it slows it down and actually you're trying to impose a bit of work of breathing to try to slow down their respiratory rate. Does that make sense? But oh, what about the it's really sensitive? complicated. Yeah. It's, not, it's not making sense to me. I okay. want you to go back. Okay. Like that. So you can put the trigger up as well, but you have to be really careful if you put the trigger up too high. Then the baby may still pant, and then they're getting no support or less support, so they actually work harder. Mm -hmm. So um, generally when they're panting, they're generating very fast flows. So you're talking about up Sorry. Yeah. Just as a flow sensor, separate model, SMB plus, uh, no, no, in pressure like support like, only. Pressure not, not in the, I'll show you the second oh. one here. So they're breathing very fast here. They're puffing away and generating high flows, right? And generally they're breathing fast because there's no uh, imposed, there's no work of breathing on the system because they're able to do it, right? Um, so if you slow the gas flow down, then you're relatively breast starving them during each inflation and you're increasing their work, imposed work of breathing. So they're going to have to work a bit harder. So as a consequence, some babies will slow down their rate. Um, so you're kind of pushing them into a uh, slower rate by making it harder for them to breathe a little bit uh, because they're doing it too effectively. Honestly, though, most people just take your PSC off. <laughs> so um, usually we start thinking of uh, expiratory synchrony predominantly with the meconiums yeah. because they're going so fast yeah. and they're all big babies. So most of the things keep going out of control. So often with the Maconi ones, we sedate them down yeah. in acute lung disease. If not, make them apneic, we, yeah. we sedate them enough to make sure they're really comfortable because they get really nasty pulmonary hypertension and lots yes. of shunts. And if you're agitated, your shunts get worse. So if we would sedate them with um, analgesia and then if they're still shunting and, and deoxygen, we will muscle relax them in acute care just to, to get them through. Um, but we also flick them to high frequency quite quickly mm -hmm. and, and treat their pulmonary hypertension. Yeah. Um, and they puff though for ages, don't they? Yeah. So you have to warn the parents afterwards that they're tachypneic for often two to three months after yeah. their acute disease. Yeah. Same with the CDH babies. You have to warn the parents they're going to be tachypneic for months. Yeah. Or as they sort of people get anxious. Yeah. So in India, Every time I've come, people talk about SIMV with uh, pressure support. So I think, and in Australia, most places don't do this much. We do. Um, in our unit, we use this mode and PTV the most commonly. Um, I think it depends on what disease you're treating, right? If you've got acute lung disease, like meconium or RHMD, you want to treat every inflation with the same support, right? And make it easier on PTV. Because on PTV you don't have multiple things, so all of these things go away, right? You just set your TI, your backup rate, your tidal volume, your PEEP and your maximum PEEP and you let the baby work away. On SIMV with pressure support, you're setting the SIMV settings and the pressure support settings. So if you've got acute lung disease, it's unlikely you need them to be different. Mm. 
So we tend to use this as a weaning tool weaning. in term babies. Because I find in preterm babies, we just leave them on PTB with what I guarantee, and they just mm. auto wean mm. quite quickly, and then you extubate them. But in term babies, sometimes you can't extubate them mm. because they don't have lung disease, they have mm. opiates or surgical wound or whatever, some other problem, and they tend to actually get overventilated, don't they, on PTB. So that's probably why you use it too, is it that setting, those babies that have good yeah. CO2 clearance? Yes. Normal level. And then you're setting your SIV rate, aren't you, as your weaning rate. And what are you doing with the pressure support? What's the purpose there? Why are you using pressure support? It's to support the spontaneous spontaneous. But you're doing that with your SIV. Okay, fixing your rate. Mm. Yeah. So why not put them on pressure support for every breath? <laughs> That's just you need a confidence level to, yeah. to do that. Well, maybe I, it's probably easier. Yeah. So I would say that where I use it is where you have a baby with good CO2 clearance, mm. right? And you're using it as a weaning tool. You're going to use your SIV rate. Your SIV component of it is the bit that's controlling tidal your your gas exchange. So if your CO2 is too high, you'll drop your tidal volume or you'll drop your rate. And you'll do that on the SIV component. And it may be that you need to go to a very low rate, like 20 breaths a minute, right? Or 30 breaths a minute, because their CO2 is normal, but they're breathing at 60 breaths a minute. So you're not supporting every breath then, right? So asked, you're asking the baby to work harder for all the other breaths. So if you turn this off, you can see the baby's getting the 20 supported breaths. For every other breath, the baby is having to generate all of the effort themselves against the circuit and the gas flow. So it's harder than if they were extubated. So what pressure support in this mode is designed to do is to offload the work of breathing from the circuit. And generally, if you look at the data from the um, Milan group, uh, not Milan, um, Miami group in Florida, you need a pressure support of about three to six centimetres of water above peak to offload the work of breathing. But you're not aiming to generate any tidal ventilation of that. The baby's still doing all the tidal ventilation in the pressure support breath. So you're just doing it as a comfort work of breathing tool. So if our peep is six, then we want our pressure support at about probably nine or 10, right? And here you can see we're getting that little pressure wave that's occurring, and then every so often you get the big SIV rate. This one is a PIP of pressure support. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's, good for it's not like in an adult patient so where it says pressure support yeah, yeah. is the value above P. Yeah. So it's good so. for the improving lung or the weaning lung because yeah. you are needing to give high pressure support, it's as good as PTV then, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. yeah if you're yeah. using yeah. high pressure support, then just have the PTV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot less numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it does give you the option to have a baby. So we sometimes, some of our term babies who are post-surgical, we can't extubate because they're on too much opiates and they're overventilated. You can just have them on a rate of 10 with pressure support and they're often very comfortable. You wouldn't want to have them on a rate of 10 without it because they'd be getting all that PT CPAP and effort. I mean, they'll just sit there until you extubate. But obviously, the better thing is just to extubate them if you can. So we tend to only use it, if we've got acute lung disease, we use PTV out of we go to this when we're using it to wean slowly off other Does that make sense? Is that... What else can we talk about this one? Sorry? Asynchrony. Asynchrony. It's maybe difficult to Yeah, I think it's hard to show. I mean, it's easy to see what asynchronous is. That's sort of an asynchronous. Uh... Sorry? Trying to find it. 
find an asynchronous sort of pattern. I'm not really sure we're going to be able to demonstrate asynchrony easily. Um, asynchrony is often around patient comfort, patient position, and then thinking about our trigger and our rise time. Any other quick? What, what else would you like to know? Especially for the fellows. The mum's there if you want to play with that too. So I have a question. In uh, non invasive mode, in CPAP mode in this training, there is something called as CPAP pressure on the. Uh, so non invasive. So Yep, which one? So, yeah, so, uh, it's because yeah. here, if you go to the adults, mm -hmm. we have apnea time. So, if, if you ventilator is giving me the CPAP, but if you turn this one on, the ventilator will push some stimulation right. But normally it would only do that in yes. certain situations. Like we never turn the stimulation on, we just have them on backup. We generally we have on CPAP, otherwise we put them on in IPPV. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, we would just, if we want backup rest, we just put them on this. But this one is just in case of apnea. Yeah. So it will kick in only if you have an apnea. Now just show non-invasive triggering. The trigger is here and it's in as a percentage. I always start high and then I don't start low. I then wean it down if they're overly triggering. And here it's probably overly triggering, right? Yeah, since it's recorded when it's recorded. It's because it's clearly we're at the egg. So you might want to turn the trigger down in this case. But I think every time I've used it, I've left them at a high trigger. Okay, I'll show you with Do you want a non recoil one? No, I would start with this. So, no, I just want the last. In this situation, it's just high frequency because we've got an ET tube, right? So you can see the settings are exactly the same, but in non invasive, you'll have no, you'll have a big leak. I asked, no, you don't use a synchronized NIP. Everyone uses unsynchronized. Which is interesting because a lot of the conference I go to, everyone says, oh, we always synchronize. No one seems to. Well, no, I don't know anyone that is. Do you, in the UK, okay, were they synchronizing? I think they were on the Sophie. Yeah. They have just moved to Essence. I, I don't like No, but they all have synchronization. Yeah. yeah, but some are not.
as easy to sing. Like yeah. the Fabian, you know, there's different ones. No, it's a Fabian that it's in. Ah, okay. It, it says that it's synchronized, but actually it doesn't do it very well. But if you have the essay, you should try because the people using the synchronized one, the feedback are very positive. So give a try. I, I will give a try at least. It's really interesting. No one seems to synchronize, even though we talk about it, right? I think they were no. using because Athena did this and they were using synchronized ones. Yeah. I think they just bought new machines. I'm sure they're using synchronized ones. I had some of your coding problems. Yeah. There was no one in Melbourne. There was no one in Melbourne synchronizing ones. I don't know. Why are they not being started? I don't know. I asked and then I said to them at the perimeter, why are you not? You're meant to be like the evidence-based people, yeah. and they said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe what is available for yeah. the hard is worth doing it properly. Yeah. Can you extubate a baby from the motion field? Like it should be baby, and then after two, three days, can we have extubate for the fourth setting? Initially, on the energy is the same. Setting field is in the condition, and then the fourth is more pressure. What would you do? But the answer is there's no right or wrong answer, right? So, because they're not the same, it depends what your settings are. Um, and I think it depends on why you think they're going to fail. Because remember, with NIPPD, you've got a big leak. So your pressure delivery is going to be very variable. And that pressure delivery is variable in, in peak and pit, not just pit. You can focus on the pit. So you could have a peak that's varying a lot, you could have a pit that's varying a lot. Um, so, I probably, if you look at most of the trials, they've used NIPPV of sort of 15, 10 to 15 on 5 to 8 generally. I think that's not unreasonable for extubation failure, although you could ask yourself why not just extubate them to a CPAP of 9, but that's probably the same thing. But I think if you've got acute lung disease, um, you probably, I would use a higher PIP. And then I'd watch the patient and see whether the NIPPV is correlating to chest wall rise or not. Um, because the benefit may not be from tidal ventilation improvement from NIPPV, it may be upper airway tone. So I'd look at chest wall rise and look at whether I, do I want chest wall rise raised from my NIPPV? Am I comfortable to increase it again? Do I have a big mouth leak? That sort of stuff. But, um, I probably avoid using PIPs above 20 in most babies. So, um, because I think then probably you've either just got a huge gas leak or you've probably you've got a baby that wasn't ready to be extubated. Um, and I generally use rates of sort of 20 to 30 to start with, sometimes higher, like 40, and then wean them down if it's for post extubation failure. But again, if you look at the trials, most use a much lower rate, like 20. 10 to 20. So, but I tend to start higher and then wind down. But I'm not afraid to using higher peaks, so I guess that's probably more comfortable. Oh, it depends on the size of the baby. Yeah. So the bigger baby is probably 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and the smaller baby is a smaller eye time. The TI in the study, what it was shown is that when you have the two branches like that, with one branch which works differently and the pressure that they set is also lower because they can't go higher it's limited to the gallery yeah. Yeah. so the setting might be slightly different depending on the kind of and they have a lot of and <laughs> What's your winning, uh, uh, like readiness for winning? What can you follow? Like, there are different ways, you know, like the peep trial, CET peep trial, or so, turning peep. Are they like breathing? Yeah. Do they have good gas exchange? Yeah. Yes. Is my mean airway pressure low? So, for me, generally, for a preterm baby, if they're on a PIP of 10 to 12, and then and they've got a 
for most of our unit, our babies are on peeps of eight, yeah. and then some of them six, so we use a bit higher peeps. Yeah. That means they're using very little delta P, yeah. um, so they're probably not needing the tidal ventilation to extubate. And is there FO2 in a range that I'll extubate for, and also give me enough buffer for it to go up? Um, if they're a term baby, I'm going to some, you know, offer a PIP of 15 will be enough to extubate yeah. the baby, right? So I'm looking at the numbers, yeah. and yeah, I do, I do do the. Um, uh, a, a, peak, uh, a, a CPAP trial, yeah. but again I'm from Melbourne where we sort of did a lot of them anyway, so I do put them onto CPAP for, um, yeah, yeah, each CPAP for three minutes, watch the saturations, if you, or you could technically you could put them on pressure support and turn their pressure support on. Yeah, yeah. And if they're on the oscillator, on this machine, I turn the delta P down to about three or four centimetres of water, and that's just CPAP. If they're on the sensimetics, I just press the oscillation button off. Yeah. yeah. Oh, do you? On the 5,000, you don't? Yeah. Uh, I just turn it down to three or four centimetres of water. But how long does it pause for? No, I wouldn't just pause for minutes. No, three to four minutes. So I just, well, I just turn this down. So. Um, and then I watch what they do and watch yeah. their breathing and extubate. Right? Oh, generally you get a sense, but certain babies you're in a few days, you know, you want to make sure 100% yeah. they will get extubated. Right? But it doesn't make sure 100%. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, sometimes they're here and then they do well. Yeah. Other way around. That paper of OMARS was like 83 or something percent, but then the subsequent studies show, some of them show no difference over yeah. just extubating yeah. without them. Yeah. Sick kids also uh, used to have argument. Uh, the artist will come, oh, he's failed CPAP. Forget it, just extubate and then they do fine. You know, like, Sometimes they struggle through the eating, yeah. And sometimes they pass and then they yeah, fail they expression, fail. right? So, yeah. But remember, it's, you've got other things going on, right? You know, suction, secretion, comfort, feed tolerance, reflux. We get a lot of our chronic babies who fail because of reflux. And then we put a jejunal tube in and they extubate beautifully, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. In our unit, we give a lot of them because we have a lot of chronically ventilated babies and a lot of airway babies. So all babies with airway disease, we always give steroids. Um, so our babies having maxillofacial ENT surgery always do. And then we would do it on a case-by-case -case basis for other babies. But generally, babies who've been ventilated for more than about five or six days, we would give some steroids for. And it also depends on what their leak's been as well. If they've had an 80% leak with an appropriate size tube, then I'm probably not going to worry too much about steroids. Yeah, yeah. More than five to seven Excellent. days. Yeah, five to seven days of ventilation, I think. So, it's usually just two days, yeah, two to three days. It depends if they're an EMT baby, often a lot more than that because we're so cautious. You know, yeah. Is that the same? Is that your practice as well? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. steroids? Uh, just for extubation? Yeah. I think we'll probably wait for longer, not five to seven days. Their threshold is It depends, I think, on the leak as well yeah. and what their risk of failure is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Especially if they failed before, and if EMT has said, then yeah. they would. We use a lot more steroids in our unit than the perinatal unit next door, because I think we've got a bias because we have so many airway babies that we just tend to get anxious about. Yeah, but we use a lot more opiates as well. So. Yeah. The 0.25 per kilo dexamethasone. 150 mics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, no, no. We have like Epic or Cern or wherever you use. Once you've got that, you definitely know none of the doses anymore. Because when you go and dry dexamethasone on ours, it says indication, extubation, then it says here is the dose. Is that correct? You go click and it goes to prescribe. This is the idea unit. Yeah, the biggest unit to tell us. So, our own unit will be using more. Yeah. And we use a lot of steroids for chronic lung. Mm -hmm. 
space. And I think more and more you realise you don't follow the protocols. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to start? Do you ready the <laughs> How early do you start? Or how late? As late as possible. Yeah, so we don't follow. We've got one unit in Melbourne that is using early hydrocortisone, zone, uh, which I don't think works. Uh, in, the first, in under 10 days, in under 7 to 10 days. I don't think it works, personally, because all those babies come on hydrocortisone and they look awful. <laughs> and then we wouldn't use it before the 14 day mark, 10 to 14 day mark, under the sort of mere analysis. And then the answer is, it's like, it's so but once you start, <laughs> Unless they extubate properly, yeah. And I think we've got a one of our fellows did a study looking at the Royal Women's Royal Melbourne, uh, Royal Children's steroid practices, and she's been trying to get it published and struggling. And I think if more than half of our babies don't get the prescribed, don't get DART or Cummings, they get something else. So even though we only have two protocols, we've DART. We only use Cummings generally for the sickest babies after they've had a couple of failed in course of DART and only with parental consent now. Um, at least, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was at least half of the babies prescribed steroids were getting an out of, out of protocol regime. We, generally, it means that they start on DART and people are reluctant to wean it. So they take you know longer on DART than the prescribed course. Yeah. So. Oh, and of course, we have the, um, the PLUS trial is finished recruiting. That's the Brett Manley study, um, which is um, budesonide given ah, with surfactant, which oh, okay. is comes from the Taiwanese group from Ye's study. Ah, yeah, yeah. Ye's practice, and Ye showed that data at PAS this year um, of a randomised controlled trial, their second trial, and huge reductions in chronic lung disease. Um, so again, um, but it was very happy. It was there was a hundred percent parental compliance, which. Is a little bit hard to believe around how informed the consent was. Um, so, um, but that's the, they've finished recruiting plus, and that was a thousand babies. And I know they're showing it at cool topics, no hot topics, hot topics. In December, Washington, Washington, in Washington. December. So that trial must, and that finished in about Marchish. So they must be. They, I know they're refining the data. So by the end of the year, we'll know about that more about it. But it's still the first big trial. And there's another US, there's a US trial called the BAP or BEEPER or BEEP or something trial, um, um, which is the same as PLUS. It's a budesonide surfactant vector trial. Okay. Um, the yeah, same one thing. came, I think, very recently. I saw one paper that combined. Yeah, there's, I don't think there's been a big clinical trial, oh, except for the yay one. Yeah, there is. Oh, there was a small one, I think. Yeah, there was. Yeah. yeah. So they presented like a group of them. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. But that's a, so that's probably one of the new. That trial, I think, will be important when it comes out because it may alter practice. Um, um, although I suspect people want to wait for the American trial as well, which will still be four years away. But um, um, it, the only difficulty is it, it is currently off-label. If you do use Curacerf here, yeah. If you read Curacerf's guidelines, it says it can't be mixed with anything else. So. The trial had to be done as an off-label pharmaceutical trial with Curacel helping them. So it, it would be, if they find a positive result, I think they'll have to see, you'll either have to get local regulatory approval to go off-label, or be, or Curacel will have to change. Yeah. We might have to sweet at that point. Yeah. The other issue with that trial is that the environment for the PLUS protocol I think allows up to three doses of surfactant because the first dose didn't have to be randomised because they had prospective consent. So it'll be interesting to see how many babies have got three versus two doses as well. Yeah, it'll be interesting to know.
Staying so long. Oh, yeah. Are you happy yes, that we wrap up now? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Very good. Bees there. It's, it's a long session, so <laughs> we have a tea break or a final, final tea, tea break and with some snacks. So please sure, sure. have it. Thank you for arranging. Stop. Nice. Thank you very Feeling much. Stop. Thank you for staying so long. It's a very long day. Appreciate Thank you so much for your yes. excellent yes. talks. Yeah, yeah. Yes. We wish we could have you longer. <laughs> Another day, I mean, not this evening. <laughs> Hopefully I can come back to India. You should. Yes. You should. It's been the last time I was here was 2018. Yes. So. Was, COVID came. Then there, well, it was very. Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah. COVID so after changed. COVID, it, this right? is just first time yeah. we started now uh, this kind of uh, yeah, I mean, education. That's what I was trying uh, to get to the. Well, if you'd have more time yesterday, you would have gone to the units also. Yeah. Maybe we should. We should plan. Maybe next yeah. time. Maybe we'll, next we'll, time. We'll plan some more. We'll, we'll plan the program. Better. Yeah, we'll plan a we'll program. Plan a program. <laughs> we'll, 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 no free time. We'll, 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 no free time. <laughs> Let them fund the program. Let them fund. Let me fund for us. Yeah, yeah. We'll plan that one day. Uh, university or medical college so that we, we can cover it. You know, more. Uh, more trainees. Uh, and two units are there. And no, your idea will be right. Those are babies there. Yes. yes. We have 200 babies. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. next time I think yeah, that would be much, much better. Yes, because yes. that experience sharing and education yes. that is yeah. the best part i think yes. but you don't need me to come you guys know all of this already no no don't say yeah. that no i was like there listening all, to all these yeah, small things which, which will make a difference to patient management yeah. 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 small yeah. things yeah. which experience we experience sharing is yeah. uh, which really we tend good to ignore generally yeah. you know okay the patient is doing well people. okay okay move on let's see the next baby so these these sessions i think such kind of sessions these kind of sessions they look very basic sessions, but I, there is more clarity during these sessions. sessions. Okay. And this will definitely help treating the babies. Yeah, we'll, uh, actually we should plan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we, we'll be in touch, Dr. Yeah. Swati, definitely. Do you do lung so, ultrasound? Sorry? Yeah. Do you do lung ultrasound? Yes. yes. Uh, they're, they're doing a project on that. Do you like it? Yes. Oh, you like it. Yeah, you're doing right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do you think it's something you'll be doing routinely? Or I mean, we are trying to get, I mean, it's still not become a routine, but yeah. I think that's what we are trying to get. Yeah. As a part so of that, acute deterioration, yeah, yeah. and RDS, again, you know, you can always decide based on X-ray, but having some scoring, it adds on to yeah. the other Yeah, I could. It's picking up slowly. I think it's a good, yes, I think it's a good thing to learn. Yeah. And it doesn't, it's not hard. It's not hard, it's easy. Yeah. So I think Patricia is in Perth, now. I was there in Perth. Trisha's in Perth. Yeah, yeah. so she, when she came and she started now, everyone, after Echo, they finished, yeah. quickly do lung ultrasound also. Yeah. So now they're saying they're picking up a lot of things. So it's actually <coughs> a culture change in the unit. If you get into that routine yeah, of yeah. doing a routine, Echo has yeah. become a culture now. Yeah. So lung ultrasound also has to be. And that doesn't take time, it's just five minutes. No. Good. Okay. All right. Let's have a happy So, so your, your best friend is basically insisting you to you can extend your uh, stay. Yes. Not this trip. <laughs> Not this time. <laughs> next time. Next I'm time. a board service on my day. I think if I didn't show up, my colleagues would kill me. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely yeah. in coming few months of the year. So yeah, I'm on board yeah, service. We have a new, we've had to change our service because of the demand because we have so few nurses we're often 
really tight for access. So we've had to introduce a third consultant who just does referrals and bed management now. So if there's a clinical care that's getting impacted by the staffing issues. So I've got a week of discharging patients and arguing over admissions to go to. And there's no way my colleagues will let me get out of that because no one else wants to. <laughs> yeah. A lot of time, I think, last 48 hours. <laughs> Since last three months, he was quite uh, excited to meet you. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were yeah, a fellow for ages, yeah. 13 years now. <laughs> we met in Greece. In, yeah, yeah, recently, yeah. In our old hospital. You were in our old hospital. Our old hospital. Not Boynton, not the new one. Oh, RCH. Sorry. RCH, yeah. It was just moving that year, 2011. It's very similar design to your new hospital, uh, the MRR one. Bigger. Bigger, yeah. CH is yeah. But yeah, but it has done good job to at least give a good infrastructure. So but we don't have private pediatric, much private pediatric inpatient hospital in, in, in Australia. Yeah. Most most private is in adult medicine. Yeah. 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 There's no private NICU in, in Victoria. I don't think in any of Australia there's a private NICU. Because it's private now. No, it's a public hospital. They have private patients, but not a whole NICU that's private. Yeah.